a live streaming from the um, Royal Pearl Group of Hospitals. As you know, Royal Pearl Group of Hospitals, as you know, Royal Pearl Group of Hospital is uh, primarily directed towards propagating academics. So we mean only academics and nothing but academics. And we don't expect anything except just teaching. And for teaching, we never, never, never expect anything. A live streaming from the um, Royal Pearl, a live streaming from Shiva. Sir? Uh, yeah, I'm going to mute you. Fine, sir. Fine, sir. Okay, so um, we from Royal Pearl, uh, we want to propagate the uh, academics in various fields of ENT. So as you know, we have been doing live surgeries almost every day. And that is today also we did a cordoma, level cordoma, and that was live. And uh, every day we are doing something to teach. And uh, last Sunday we did a program um, on uh, basics of how to read the temporal bone and uh, CT scan and MRI. And now uh, we are also doing grand rounds for the sake of exam going PGs. So all this is for teaching, nothing else. Now, uh, I have a great friend in Hyderabad since I'm also practicing in Hyderabad. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have gelled very well. And um, I have been uh, seeing this great gentleman, both operating as well as uh, uh, in various conferences while giving lectures. Uh, you all need no introduction, but some people abroad, like uh, uh, other countries, might need an introduction. Uh, he is Dr. Srinivas Kishore, and uh, he is one of the legends in the field of sleep apnea. And uh, I have uh, been impressed and I have learned, uh, I, I'm sure that, you know, the whole world uh, knows him as a very, very, very efficient and excellent sleep apnea surgeon. And uh, I just casually asked him, sir, can you do a series of uh, lectures on sleep apnea? And initially we planned it for one day. That is one whole day, that Sunday alone. But then I thought uh, if we break it into three modules, then it will be very interesting. Each module lasting for two hours. And Dr. Srinivas Kishorji uh, kindly consulted, uh, consented to do it. He is actually the director of uh, AIG Group of Hospitals. And uh, he's a leading consultant, having excellent practice. And uh, also, more importantly, is very well-read, knowledgeable, very affable, and uh, down-to-earth, humble gentleman. And I am really, really, really a big fan of this great gentleman. And I'm sure today, from today, that is today is the first day of the lecture series on uh, sleep apnea. From today, you will be learning A to Z of OSA. OSA is a field which is still not very well understood by several people across the world. Even the patients don't have that you know, uh, knowledge about what can be the consequences of snoring. And uh, so if we learn the right signs of OSA from the greatest legend of Indian uh, you know, scenario, I'm very sure that uh, we can transfer this to our patients. That is the motive. So without much ado, Royal Pearl Hospital brings you OSA A to Z by Dr. Srinivas Kishore. Over to you, sir. Can you hear me? Of course. Thank you very, very much for your very kind words, uh, Janki. I mean, uh, the admiration is, of course, uh, I'm one of the huge admirers of you and your wonderful work. And this aspect of yours that is teaching and sharing is, this is what has completely flowed me. And I think this is a great initiative. Um, so I think in the next three days, what I would like to convey is right from basics that we're going to start today. This is like how we discussed in the, uh, in the few minutes before uh, the live uh, session started. Uh, we are going to cover everything right from postgraduate level to a consultant level. 
And uh, I would kindly request you, if there is anybody who likes to stop me and ask any question they didn't understand, because some of these things are very different from our regular ENT practice. There will be a lot of graphs, waves, and things like that that might come in, especially in the second talk, which is polysomnography. I would be very slow in that. And if there is any doubt, please stop me. Uh, one minute. I just want to interrupt here. Uh, so Dr. Shiva is going to moderate because he's having the desktop from Royal Pearl Hospital. Okay. And if anybody has got a doubt, please don't unmute yourself because we'll uh, disturb the flow of the uh, lecture. You can type it as a, a message in the chat box. And after a segment of maybe um, maybe a segment, he can um, you know pause for a minute and then we'll ask the questions because I don't want to stop the flow of Dr. Srinivas Kishorji. And uh, Shiva, don't unmute anybody. I don't want any uh, you know extrinsic noises here. I want a very perfect, uh, clear presentation from sir. And okay. you can, uh, any of the audience, they can type the uh, question in the chat box. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Okay, so let me just start sharing my presentation, which is the first talk for today. Can you see the presentation? Yes, sir. Yes. yes, yes. Yes. So today we are having three talks. One is uh, what we call as functional assessment of the upper airway in sleep-related breathing disorders, which will also include a little bit of introduction about sleep-related breathing disorders as a gamut of disorders. Then this next talk is going to be polysomnography, and then we're going to talk about drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So I'm going to first start by showing you three particular videos. Now pay attention to the sellout of these patients, how they basically are looking and their facial grimace, and then I will go about with the flow. Why I'm showing you these particular three videos you will understand a little later. Let me start with this patient. This gentleman is happily sleeping. You would observe that he's slightly on the obese side. He stopped breathing. And you can see the saturation going down. And this is something that is normal for him on a daily basis. Now look at this patient. Again, the same thing that is common between the first video and second video is that these guys are also sleeping with their mouth open. And you can see that the tongue is not sitting or not hugging the palate. And this is called as loss of coupling. A lot of it we're going to discuss in the next slides to come. Now, this is another patient completely in the other end of the spectrum. So we saw three different patients, one who's slightly on the obese side, the one in the middle, and now this patient who's purely on the skeletal side, looks very skinny, but on this skeletal side. This, my dear colleagues, is sleep-related breathing disorder. Now, sleep-related breathing disorder is not a single entity. It actually comprises of four different conditions called primary snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, and obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Now, all of these conditions basically come under the umbrella of sleep-related breathing disorders. Now, how are all of these different? Now, in primary snoring, yes, there is snoring, but the patient does not have any repeated arousals. He arouses his, his sleeping partner, but he won't be aroused. Next, 
there are no desaturations and there is no type 2 respiratory failure. For those of you who have, want to be brushed at about type 2 respiratory failure, it's a condition wherein there is increased CO2 in the body causing respiratory failure. The next in the line of severity of the problem is a condition called upper airway resistance syndrome. Now, these patients are people like you and me who are on the thinner side, on the skinny side, but they snore, they have repeated arousals, but they do not have desaturations or they do not have any type 2 respiratory failure. The next in line in the hierarchy of severity of the problem is the condition called OSAS or obstructive sleep apnea syndrome or OSAS obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome. Now here, what is common between the earlier two predecessors is that the patients snore, the patients have repeated arousals, and yes, they do have desaturations, but they do not have type 2 respiratory failure because of carbon dioxide retention. The last person or the last or in terms of severity is a condition called obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Yes, they snore. Yes, they have arousals. They have desaturation. And yes, they retain carbon dioxide in the body even during the day. So the first three conditions are necessarily only a night problems, whereas obesity hypoventilation syndrome patients are so sick that they continue to hypoventilate during the day. And this distinct differentiation between the different conditions of sleep-related breathing disorder is very essential for us to understand and phenotype these particular patients. Now, Let's concentrate on obstructive sleep apnea. Now, obstructive sleep apnea, as we said, is not just a condition, but it is a syndrome. It is not only caused by narrow, crowded, collapsible airways, but it is also caused by decreased muscle tone, decreased response of your chemosensitive or chemoreceptors to the gases inside the body. It is also caused by how your brain's arousal center is responding to the effort that your body is putting in to gain oxygen into your body and also poor muscle tone. All of these pathophysiologies put together come to form the condition called obstructive sleep apnea. This is something that we have published uh, in the sleep medicine clinics very beautifully. And to sum up, in, this is one of the um, uh, images from that particular art article that we published, wherein what, uh, to put everything into a single gamut, the entire pathophysiology into a simple gamut of what encompasses obstructive sleep apnea. I'll be very happy to share this particular article to who of you who wants to, you can uh, actually reach out to Dr. Shiva and he'll probably facilitate to share this particular article wherein we spoke in detail about the anatomy and pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea. Now, let's talk a few words about the disease itself. And this is something that is very shocking. It is estimated that the average lifespan of an untreated obstructive sleep apnea, supposing you have treated, you have diagnosed obstructive sleep apnea on a gentleman or a, a, or a lady patient, and you found out that this is, and this patient has obstructive sleep apnea, and the patient decides not to go ahead with the treatment, their lifespan is cut down by, short, by 20 years than the average lifespan of the general population. And this is across, across the, uh, the uh, countries. So once you've diagnosed it, if you don't treat, their lifespan cuts down by 20 years. Now, if you look at most of the developed countries, and I'm proud to say that India has also contributed in a, in a, in a very bad way. 
Why do I say that? Look at each of these countries. On the upper part, you have necessarily a Caucasian population. Below, you have a purely Mongoloid kind of a population. And in between is India, right? And based on polysomnography, we have beaten all of these countries hollow. 7.5% of Indians have obstructive sleep apnea. And this is done by Johns Hopkins. So the data is authentic and this is proper data. And what is shocking is that our women predominance is much higher than any other country. So dear colleagues, we have a significant predominance of incidence of this particular disease in our country. 7.5% and 4.5% of population having this particular problem. So all these patients have this particular condition manifesting these, these particular comorbidities in this particular percentages. And what is shocking is nighttime heart attacks of 91%. Now, it is very, very important that these comorbidities make it very, very necessary this, for this condition to be treated. And if you look at worldwide, 30 to 40 million patients have are remain undiagnosed with individual conditions like this, not understanding what is causing this. And the common denominator for all these conditions is obstructive sleep apnea. So the emphasis is on early detection and management. It is very important that we diagnose children with adenoid phases, children with gross tonsillar hypertrophy, children with uncontrolled allergies, because these children, when not diagnosed and do not and not treated, will, because of the consequences in the skeletal growth, will become tomorrow's obstructive sleep apnea. So the emphasis, dear colleagues, as ENTs is on us. A lot of pediatricians, unfortunately, do not understand that concept. We are, talk, we are going to talk very much in detail about uh, pediatric obstructive sleep apnea on the third day. But today's pediatric OSA patients are tomorrow's adult, uh, adult OSA patients. The line should be more in, in primary care. If you identify, there is a lot of literature that shows that today's primary snorer is tomorrow's OSA patient. So for all these patients, evaluation is the key. And once you have evaluation, you will have the right algorithm to treat these particular patients. But why do I emphasize about this so much? Because as you've seen in the earlier slide, obstructive sleep apnea doesn't come in one shape. It presents differently to different people. Why do I say that? To an ENT, obstructive sleep apnea patients come in the form of patients with nasal obstruction and snoring. But the same patient with obstructive sleep apnea to the cardiologist, he presents with uncontrolled hypertension with a minimum of two or three drugs. To a pulmonologist, the same sleep apnea presents as a shortness of breath. To a spine surgeon, he presents with postural issues. To an orthodontist, he presents with malocclusions. To a urologist, the patient, they would present with nocturnal enuresis, thinking that it's a prostate problem. To a neurologist, the same sleep apneic patient presence as uncontrolled migraine, and to a psychiatrist, he may present with depression. No matter how they present, these patients have a common denominator, obstructive sleep apnea. So it is very, very important that you ask the right questions. So just because you're in ENT, you should not stop asking the questions relating to posture or relating to nocturnal enuresis or a question that, do you have uncontrolled migraine? The moment you ask the right questions, because the patient doesn't know, right? 
the impetus is on you as a treating physician for somebody who's treating this patient to ask the right questions because the patient does not know what to tell you. So it is very important that you understand this particular slide very well so that we can ask the right questions to the patient. Now, when you talk about the area of involvement, it's right from the nose to the larynx. So evaluation starts right from the nose to the larynx. So once you understand this, then you will start asking the right questions. One also needs to understand and differentiate between obstructions and collapses. Now they are not the same. Collapses are something that happen only during a person's particular sleep. Whereas obstructions are static in nature and they are there all the time. So you need to differentiate obstructions and this understanding of this pathophysiology is very, very important as somebody who, pay, who treats obstructive sleep apnea. Now, as you all know, most of us also understand that the treatment for adult obstructive sleep apnea is PAP therapy. Fantastic, strong suggestions, agreed. Everybody says that. But things are not that easy. The gold standard of PAP therapy comes with its own problems. If you ask my patient lady here who has three bindis, she will say, I will never go back to that particular therapy, even though it is gold standard. And I will show you in the, sub, in the next talk how CPAP works and how we will be as ENT surgeons, we are beautifully poised to see what is happening in the upper airway once we put the CPAP machine. So CPAP, dear colleagues, even though it is considered to be the gold standard, is marred with problems. They are, they are forced to use it. If they use it, that's great. We are happy because they are using the gold standard therapy. But compliance, dear colleagues, right from 1980s, since the advent of the onset of PAP therapy, it, the, the acceptance has still been about 40 to 50% only, even with the latest technologies. So if you look at this beautiful study that has come from William Demand and Cleet Kushida, this has come from the Makkah of of uh, sleep medicine. This is from Stanford. And they did a beautiful study called the APPLES study. It's a six month randomized, double blind, two arm, sham controlled, multicentric trial. And they found out that the compliance rate at six months, that means today you've given a CPAP to about 100 people. At the end of six months, there are only 40 people who are using the gold standard therapy. What is happening to the 60% of the 60 other people? They have not used it or they have not used it in the duration of time that they are supposed to use it. So what does that make them? Non-compliant to the gold standard therapy. So what do we do with that significant chunk of patients? Do we leave them? And what happens to all such patients in whom they have these typical anatomical structural abnormalities wherein they are not able to use the CPAP? Do you call them failed treatments? What do you do? So obviously, once the gold standard treatment is, is not being accepted, you, as somebody who is going to take care of this patient, is now confused. Now, what is the next best treatment do I do for these particular patients? What should I do? So there are multiple options. Which door do I open? You're obviously confused. So obviously, we as ENT surgeons are best poised to take this challenge up to take care of these patients so then we take them to the next level in treatment of this particular condition. Now, 
why is it very important that we are having this particular topic? Why not just do a uvular palatopharyngoplasty for everyone and then be done with it? Because we know how to do the procedure, right? We know now that if you do uvular palatopharyngoplasty and its modifications for every single patient today, your success rate is an abysmal 40%. So if you have a patient who comes to you and says, doctor, I have this particular condition, please treat me. And I say, yes, boss, I have treatment for you, but the success rate is about 50%. The, at least you will have to put your head down in shame or the other person will say that this doctor must be mad to give me that kind of a success rate. So evaluation, dear colleagues, is very, very important because you can't do one single procedure. Do we do it the same procedure in any other ENT uh, branches? Do we do the same kind of endoscopic sinus surgery? Do we do the same kind of tympanoplasty? Do we do the same kind of head and neck work? No, we don't. Similarly, we do not do a same kind of technique or same kind of procedure for every patient of obstructive sleep apnea. So evaluation of the upper airway is pivotal for successful treatment. And that is why we are discussing this particular uh, topic now as the first lecture in this lecture series. So once you come to understand the problem, or you know that this particular patient has come to you with the snoring problem, either he is brought to you by the, uh, by the sleeping partner, or he's referred to you by a cardiologist or a pulmonologist or a dentist. The first thing that we do is ask the right questions. As I explained before, why we have to ask the right questions. Again, to bring this forward, that patients with sleep-related breathing disorder present very differently to different specialities. So for, for the junior colleagues here, there are a set of questions that you need to ask the sleeping partner, and there are a set of questions that you need to ask the patient himself. You obviously have to ask the sleeping partner for the most important question, which is witnessed apnea. And most of the time, the patient attendant or the sleeping partner themselves come to us and say, Doc, when I see them, I get scared. I tap on him and ask him to sleep to the side. And then the snoring stops for some time and again he starts. These are the stock questions that you need to ask. Not only you have to ask about witnessed apnea, you also have to ask about restless sleep is he getting up in the middle of the night? See, this is a question that a lot of people attribute it to BPH or, sir, I get up nowadays. Earlier, I was never getting up. But nowadays, I have to get up multiple times to pass urine. Needless to say that this complaint is not because of the patient's diabetes or not because of the patient's BPH. It is because of the uh, atrial natriuretic factor that is being released with every apneic spell, which is asking the patient to get up and go to the toilet. The other question that you need to ask the patient is, do you have an early morning headache? Most of the time, the patient is going to say, yes, doc, I wake up. I don't feel fresh at all. And another very typical complaint that the patient will say is, I am so tired that I am tired of being tired. Now, this particular question, you should ask any particular patient who snores because they may not be a typical case of obstructive sleep apnea. They may be a patient of upper airway resistance syndrome, wherein they may not have desaturations in the sleep study when you check them further. Then you will, you will write them off as, okay, this patient does not have sleep apnea, but this patient will have 
upper airway resistance syndrome, dear colleagues. If you remember the first slide that I told you, they have repeated arousals. Why are they having repeated arousals? Because they have increased work of breathing. Now, the problem may be just in the nose because the nose contributes to 50% of the airway uh, resistance. So just because this patient sleep study says that he does not have obstructive sleep apnea and his AHI is less than five, don't write them off and say he doesn't have OSA, his, his fatigue on his tiredness may not be because of obstructive sleep apnea. You have completely messed up that diagnosis. These are the patients we as ENTs should pick up. Upper airway resistance syndromes are the ones who are just floating around. They are nobody's babies. They are, they are tired of being tired. They are fatigued toward the day. They are having early morning headaches and they are not finding solutions anywhere. It is up to us as ENTs to pick up these patients. The next ones are the are patients with unproductive work. They say, Doc, I'm going to work, but I just don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like putting my heart and soul into the work that I'm doing. And the last but not the least, depression. This is a very common comorbidity with obstructive sleep apnea. The moment you look at his face, he's not making eye-to-eye -eye contact because of obstructive sleep apnea, because of his being unproductive, he's having a, a lot of fatigue, he's, having, he's gone into depression, he's gone to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist has given lots of drugs and all the latest drugs and the patient is having a lot of problem in terms of the drugs that he's taking which are working on his sleep cycle and he's going into an abyss because of the depression, making the sleep apnea worse. So it is again upon us as treating doctors to take care of these particular patients. Now, this is again- a Dr. Srinivas. Yes, yes. I'm going to interrupt you for some uh, questions here. Yes. Can I go to the previous yes. slide? Now, uh, just want to ask you, a case of sinusitis yes. comes to you. And uh, in a sinusitis, we have major criteria, minor criteria. Yes. For example, you have anosmia, you have epistaxis, you have nasal obstruction. Yes. And you can definitely say there are some which will go off after yes. treatment. Yes. And there are some symptoms which may not go definitely. Yes. Now, the problem now, the patient is coming to you with depression. Mm. There are patients who come to you with fatigue. There yes. are patients who come to you with nocturnal aneurysm. For example, nocturnal aneurysms, you said, yeah. uh, may not be due to that. I, am, I don't snore. Yeah. I go to a uh, toilet three times a night. Uh, just an example. Hypothetically. Yes, yes, yes. Now, the patient will ask me, how, uh, whether when I get treated, will it go off? Hmm. Now, my question to you is, hmm. like the snot scoring, like the, yes. uh, for example, the scoring of a symptom, do you have any hmm. scoring symptom, scores for any particular symptom uh, in sleep apnea? And what are the primary uh, criteria, secondary criteria? What is the assurance you can give to the patient uh, with respect to symptomatology. Sorry if I have uh, pulled the question long. But no, no, I, this is, yeah. I perfectly got it. So, see, nocturnal aneurysis is a broad symptom that can come for everything. See, what is very interesting is there are a lot of, see, if you look at your new SWOT 20, your SNOT 22 or SNOT 25, most of the questions are again related, the lower questions are related to sleep again. Most of these questions, there are overlaps. So you cannot just go only by symptoms. Once you look at the symptom, it should raise a bell that, okay, this patient, if he's saying that, like you said, you don't snore, but you have nocturnal aneurysis. That tells me that, okay, boss does not have probably a sleep-related breathing disorder. His symptom may not be related to sleep-related breathing disorder. But if you were to come to me and said, 
boss i am snoring and i have nocturnal enuresis that will raise the flag for me and you few again come back to me and said boss i don't get up fresh in the morning and i have multiple nocturnal and, and i have nocturnal enuresis so it is the summation of symptoms that actually adds to the diagnosis and that I is i am dr singh was uh, ji my yeah. question to you is very clear see there are some like for example witness apnea yes it is definitely an indication of snoring there's no doubt yes. about it yes for example uh, let us say even day time, day time sleepiness yes so this is also you know contributory to snoring in a big way correct but there are some symptoms which you have mentioned in this chart itself like depression dry mouth decreased uh-huh. libido this is decreased libido can be due to anything nocturnal yes. enuresis can be due to anything correct uh, loss of memory can be due to anything correct. so have you formed any uh, what did you uh, i mean uh, tell us like whether it is 3 plus 2 plus or maybe i understand is- so hmm. your what you are saying is in terms of validation of the symptom exactly how, sh- how sure are you that the symptom is related ah. to this particular problem and yes. that is where the questionnaire is coming that is coming next okay okay carry on so again along with this particular history we should also ask this particular history we have to ask about insomnia if there is one comorbidity which is the biggest comorbidity with obstructive sleep apnea it is insomnia and insomnia makes the gold standard therapy which is cpap very difficult to use so insomnia is divided into two types maintenance insomnia and initiation insomnia now in insomnia with maintenance is the one that is more common with osa what is maintenance insomnia that means as the name suggests you are going to sleep but you cannot maintain that sleep that is called maintenance insomnia initiation insomnia means you can't even get into stage one sleep that is initiation insomnia as the name suggest maintenance insomnia is more common with osa patients so the question you need to ask is do you have problem getting into sleep or do you have a problem that moment you you get up in the middle of the night and then after that you can't fall into sleep now this is a very important uh, symptom because this is one of the commonest comorbidities and this condition along with and this is something for post graduates comorbid osa and insomnia is called the condition is called comisa comisa is the term that is used for comorbid insomnia and and this is a menace problem because the gold standard treatment is not working because the patient is unable to use that he is not able to put on the mask because the moment he puts it on he is not able to maintain his stage of sleep the next symptom that you need to also ask for is nocturnal movement disorders now this does not mean the patient has obstructive sleep apnea now these conditions are not they are they are sleep disorders they are sleep related movement disorders but they are comorbid disorders with obstructive sleep apnea so plm or rls what does what do they mean this is periodic limb movement disorder and restless leg syndrome now plm means the patient has actually thrashing his legs during sleep now why is this important because there in the next talk you will be able to understand this there is something called arousals now and we should be able to understand why is the patient having excessive daytime sleepiness the next day why is he not refreshed why is he sleeping at 10 o'clock in the in the office because of the arousals now we need to establish the arousals are because of periodic limb movement or because of respiration and hence you need to ask the or look into this particular condition and ask the sleeping partner does this particular subject thrash his legs now restless leg syndrome is a sensory condition that means this is a question you need to ask the patient himself said so 
boss do you have legs and aches do you have, find it very difficult to sleep because you are having lot of pain in your legs this is a sensory disorder and this is a motor disorder and these two conditions and also happen in anemia and renal disease and also in pregnancy not only in obstructive sleep apnea but we it is important that you have to ask these conditions the next question that you need to ask for is boss do you have alcohol every night before you go to sleep if you go to sleep with alcohol that is important and lot of patients actually take cns stimulants like a cup of coffee like black coffee or drugs for coexisting ailments like for example there will be a patient who is taking amitriptyline for some other problem maybe a prophylaxis for migraine or some kind of a tmj problem so these patients taking drug history it is very very important because they'll have a list of these drugs which could be contributing to the severity of osc medical history especially any painful illness can cause sleep uh, disturbances some kind of uh, you know spine problems some kind of a traumatic injury to their spine or some kind of a problem that has happened that has uh, caused any limb problems and things like that narcolepsy is one condition that is pathognomonic i mean you should be able to differentiate a narcolepsy from excessive daytime sleepiness caused by obstructive sleep apnea and what is that the thing is while you are speaking a patient with narcolepsy will just drop whether you are speaking to him or no a patient with obstructive sleep apnea may not be paying attention to you and may be slowly falling asleep but a narcolepsy patient will suddenly drop so you need to make that differentiation between a narcolepsy patient and an obstructive sleep apnea patient and narcolepsy dear colleagues runs in families there is some very important social history that we need to ask for social psychosocial conditions the reason why i am telling you is uh, this is a this is something that i can go online and say i have had a very bad experience and i will tell you this why social history is very important a very high flying judge walks into my room with a newly wed couple the daughter and the son in law and this particular judge tells me that the these kids got married 3 days ago but my daughter is having terrible problem sleeping because this guy is is actually having a uh, terrible snoring right and you as a innocent doctor have now on okay now with all the judges come vip and you want to help them and you run all the tests possible you do a sleep study you do the sleep endoscopy you do this you do that and you do something and you pull the patient out of the problem and then one month later the same trio comes to the clinic and says doctor he still snoring like a bloody rhino he is snoring too much he is causing lot of problems my but my particular my daughter is just unable to sleep she is getting migraine episodes now one month is too early to do any kind of objective sleep study and then you are still thinking oh my god what did i miss this is a vip case i don't know what to do then the saga continues comes the golden time of 3 months wherein you do your post operative sleep study and to your utter dismay you find out that you did a very good job and the sleep study is showing very good success rate of this of, of the condition then you show it as an evidence to this dear judge who actually says that whatever it is uh, doc i don't care about all that my daughter says he is still snoring and i don't know what you will do about this dear kalis don't fall into this the biggest problem here is a psychological problem which that particular uh, you know family is going through for whatever problem it is 
now for since you wanted to help this particular family you did all what you could but it is a very very subjective problem so try to dig a little deeper once bitten twice shy now i take a little more history about that marital uh, marital uh, details and what is going on so a take home bitter pill is if you don't pay attention to a, a, a scenario wherein a mother in law is calling the shots or wife is probably calling the shots on some things please think about it take a little more deeper history into that particular problem and ask somebody else to get into it otherwise you will cut a sorry figure and then you will have to uh, you know take uh, take a swallow a bitter pill so social history and psychosocial history is very very important so now comes the questionnaires why are questionnaires very important questionnaires are very important because one they not only gives you give you and because you can't ask all the questions as boss asked right you can't ask all the questions so you have standard questionnaires to ask and why are these questionnaires so important once you hand out a questionnaire to a patient the patient also feels that okay my doctor is very important he is asking all these questionnaires so the first question this is for the post graduates here the first most important questionnaire that we ask in sleep related breathing disorder and osa is the epworth sleepiness scale and i'm sure all of you have heard about epworth sleepiness scale epworth sleepiness scale is a very very simple questionnaire asking a person in terms of a how they are feeling at different times in the day now what information comes out of it gives you how sleepy that particular person is what you need to understand is does epworth sleepiness scale gives you information about sleep apnea no it does not it just tells you how sleepy the person is now just because a person is having a score of more than 12 puts them in a in a zone where he may have obstructive sleep apnea but it clearly doesn't tell you that this patient has obstructive sleep apnea so these kind of questionnaires will gives you an idea or quantify the seriousness of the symptom which is excessive daytime sleepiness only but once you ask this particular questionnaire and the patient says and scores over 12 that means this patient may have a high chance of a some kind of a sleep related disorder it does not or not necessary that the patient should have an sleep related breathing disorder please understand that now this is a pictorial uh, very easy way of this is something that i use lot of patients find it easy instead of answering these questions uh, taking this question and just picking it gives a very very uh, 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 easy way of answering this uh, epworth sleepiness scale all these questionnaires would help us to engage the patient better you have a busy opd obstructive sleep apnea patient is going to take a lot of time for you so you just hand out this questionnaire and say go boss just do fill this and come back to me and then you say oh okay so patient also feels that he is connected to you and then he is also feels that he is spending more time with you now the next commonest questionnaire which is called the stop bang questionnaire the stop bang questionnaire unlike the epworth sleepiness scale gives you or predicts the seriousness or your likely could have having obstructive sleep apnea okay so it predicts also the risk of post operative complications and this is a questionnaire that post anesthetists use during their screening for fishing these patients of obstructive sleep apnea so stop bang questionnaire has a very high sensitivity to predict moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea 
So if you were to have a moderate sleep apnea, your chance of you scoring high on a, uh, uh, a stop bank questionnaire is 87%. And if you were to uh, score positive on the stop bank questionnaire, the chance that you have severe sleep apnea is almost 70%. So what is this stop bank questionnaire? Stop bank questionnaire basically means snoring. Are you feeling tired? Is there obstructive breathing, observed apnea, BP, body mass index, age, neck circumference, and male? And all of these indices make you stop having a condition called stop bag questionnaire. Stop bag questionnaire gives you the likelihood of having obstructive sleep apnea. So if you are scoring uh, low risk, zero to two questions positive, intermediate risk, three to four questions positive, and if you are scoring high of five to eight questions are positive, you have a very high chance of having obstructive sleep apnea. So stop bank questionnaire is a very, very good tool, not only for us as uh, ENTs, but also for anesthetists to rule out this particular problem. So if a patient is ranked low risk on obstructive sleep apnea by a stop bank scoring model, then it's a high, they are highly unlikely that the patient would have moderate to severe sleep apnea. The patient may have mild sleep apnea, may have, my, but up, may have upper airway resistance syndrome, but if the patient is scoring high on uh, stop bank questionnaire, it's a very high chance that the patient may have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. So how are all these questionnaires useful, right? The, the, the NOAI CNT surgeon would ask, why even invest our time in stop bank questionnaire, all these questionnaires? Like, like I said earlier, stop bank questionnaire has the highest specificity in detecting moderate OSA and all these questionnaires have very high specificity and sensitivity in picking up obstructive sleep apnea. So you can use these as a screening tool. So you want to do a study in your hospital. Let's say you want to take all the doctors working in your hospital, give them a stop bank questionnaire or Epworth sleepiness scale questionnaire and say, boss, you fill these up for me. And if there is, and you can do a study and find out how many of your, the doctors in your hospital may have obstructive sleep apnea, moderate or severe. So this is a very, very good screening tool as ENT surgeons or as anesthetists to understand this particular problem or screen out or fish out the patients of obstructive sleep apnea. Now, is there any, uh, are you clear with these, uh, with this so far? Very, very clear, very clear, very nice. Yeah. So once you have history and once you have the screening tools, the next step as ENT surgeons is we need to do evaluation. Now, this is where we as ENT surgeons are a sharp contrast compared to the other specialties who deal with this particular problem. Because nose contributes to 50% of airway resistance. So the first exam that you need to do is you need to look at the nasal valve, you need to look at the septum, look for swell bodies, look at turbinates, look at adenoids, look at polyps. A decent, good ENT nasal exam is pivotal and primary in the evaluation of upper airway of obstructive sleep apnea patients. The next step, which is something that all of us need to understand is the skeletal profile, guys. By the end of this talk, you guys should look at the road, person on the road and say, okay, skeletal profile one, skeletal profile two, skeletal profile three. Because 
these skeletal profiles make them more vulnerable to obstructive sleep apnea. So once you do a good, decent examination of the nose, you have to look at their facial silhouette. You need to look at the how their skeletal framework is. So you need to know whether he's a skeletal class one, a skeletal class two, or a skeletal class three. Retrognathic, prognathic, perfect. Because skeletal profile is very important to differentiate what algorithm you are going to follow. Are you going to follow a soft tissue algorithm or are you going to still directly go and do a skeletal algorithm? What is again very important is the piriform aperture. It is very, very important because the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. If the roof of the nose is narrow, the floor of the nose is narrow, the piriform aperture is narrow. You Even if you do a beautiful turbinoplasty, a beautiful septoplasty, if the air entry is less, the CPAP cannot push air into that nose. Or the, if you do a beautiful multi-level surgery, the obstruction is static at the level of the piriform aperture, there will be a obstruction and your surgery will fail because this patient will invariably open the mouth because he's not able to breathe through the nose. So dear colleagues, please pay attention to the dimensions of the piriform aperture. And I will talk to you about the dimensions of piriform aperture in the subsequent uh, slides. What is again very important after you look at the piriform aperture, please look down at the dentition. Directly don't jump to the oropharynx. Oral cavity is also our domain. We have to look at the angel's classification, which is class one malocclusion, class two malocclusion, class three malocclusion. Because 60% of patients with OSA will have malocclusions. Please remember that. Then the malocclusions are either a cause or a consequence of obstructive sleep apnea. So it is important not only to look at the dimensions of the periform aperture, not only important that you look at the skeletal facial profile, it is important that you look at the patient's teeth. This is what I was talking about across the age groups. And I'm sure you've seen these kind of patients. This is a pediatric high arched palate. This is an adolescent high arched palate. And this is an adult high arched palate. Now, how will this tongue fit into the mouth? It cannot. Where can this go? It can go only into the airway because this tongue cannot fit into this mouth. And this will fall into the airway even if you do a beautiful tongue-based surgery, it will not fit into the mouth. And if you remember the first three videos that I played, all of them were opening the mouth. Why were they opening the mouth? Because there is no space for the tongue to sit in the oral cavity. Their no nose is blocked because they have a high arched palate. High arched palate means narrow arch palate. That means the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose, narrow periform aperture. So, dear colleagues, please do not miss this. This is pathognomonic of obstructive sleep apnea. What is also very, very important, and this is something that I usually do, is have some kind of a ob objective measure of uh, nasal resistance. This is important for us as sleep apneic surgeons that you need to measure the nasal resistance so that I know how much of this is actually percolating downstream in terms of Bernoulli's effect. So this is a, uh, is a rhinomatometry and most of you know that this is right and left expiration and inspiration and you get uh, uh, you get a nice resistance in the form of this. You get a value here and you can look at this particular patient as it's very clearly seen in the graph that he's through the left nostril 
is not breathing properly. Now, this also tells me in terms of validation in a very uh, uh, objective way that this particular patient, but this patient didn't tell me any kind of nasal obstruction complaint at all. He came to me with breath. Uh, he says, I've been snoring like a, a, and the wife said he's snoring. If do I ask him, boss, do you have a nose block? Then no, not at all. But if I do this and he said, look, you're not breathing through that, but whatever you say, doc, I don't know. I'm not having a nasal problem at all. And if you ignore this particular problem and don't address his nose, then you are in a pickle. So it is important that we quantify nasal resistance. And I'm emphasizing again and again and again, the nose is pivotal and primary in the management of obstructive sleep apnea. If the nose is not evaluated and managed, you can't give a good result in terms of either a CPAP or a multi-level surgery. Even the gold standard therapy, you would think that what is there? You're giving the machine, the machine will blow air into you. Your colleagues, you will, and you will, and I will talk to you about CPAP compliance. A person will be only comfortable using a CPAP pressure of about eight to 10. Beyond that, if you get a CPAP pressure of 15, 16 CPAP pressure, it will just fly off the nose. And what determines that pressure? The nose. The nose is the entry point for the CPAP to let the air in. And if the nose is clogged, either by a gross septal deviation, by a turbinate hypertrophy, or whatever, a swell body or something, you will not be able to deliver the gold standard therapy also. And that is why the nose is considered pivotal and primary in the management of obstructive sleep apnea. So that is exactly what I was talking to you about. So nose increased nasal resistance will cause mouth breathing, increase in collapsibility of the upper airway because of Bernoulli's phenomena, and it will increase and exaggerate OSA. And this is a single factor which will make the patient in, uh, 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 non-compliant to the use of CPAP therapy. So look at the nose, evaluate the nose. So the next commonest problem that most of us have is the very confusing classifications that are there out there. So I want to demystify all these classifications and want to tell you what they all mean as a postgraduate and also as a clinician. What is the take home message for each of these classifications? So the first classification that we normally use is called the Friedman classification. What is Friedman classification? It is a classification wherein the only difference between the Malam Patti classification and the Friedman uh, tongue position is that in Malampati classification that our anesthetists use, the tongue is put outside. So dear postgraduates, remember this. If somebody asks you, what is the difference between Friedman tongue position and Malampati tongue position? In Malampati tongue position, the, the, the positioning is assessed with the tongue out. Whereas in Friedman tongue position, the tongue is kept inside. So what is this basically telling you? It's basically telling you that with the tongue inside, with the mouth open and asking the patient to say, ah, what are you seeing? Are you seeing the posterior pharyngeal wall? Are you seeing the fascial pillars? Are you seeing the base of the uvula? Are you using, are you looking at the entire uvula? This becomes Friedman tongue position one. The next one, is the Friedman tongue position two. Here, what is happening is there are the fascial pillars. You are able to see the base of the uvula and you are able to see the soft palate completely. The next position called Friedman tongue position three is you are just looking at the fascial arches. You are not seeing the uvula at all. And Friedman tongue position four, that is 
when the patient's tongue is inside, you are only seeing the hard palate, soft palate junction. Once you correlate this with the Brodsky's tonsil grading, which is tonsil grading one, two, three, four, which we all use, comes the, modi the, the modified Friedman tongue position system. Now, what is the information that this modified Friedman tongue position is giving you or staging system is giving you? It is telling you that if you were to have a patient with Friedman, this is the palate position or now it is called Friedman tongue position and tonsil grading which is high and low BMI, if you were to do a U triple P or its modifications, your success rate is 70%. So the use of Friedman tongue position and Friedman classification is that it will tell you which are the patients that will do well with the tongue with U triple P. But unfortunately, patients don't come with a sticker on the head saying that I am Friedman one, please do this procedure for me. Patients will come with all kinds of stages. So the biggest disadvantage with Friedman staging system is it tells you what not to do, but it does not tell you what to do. So do we as surgeons use Friedman staging? No, we don't. But it does give you some kind of a idea whether this patient has a significant tongue-based component to the whole problem or no, right? So in terms of a noise ENT surgeon who wants to take up sleep apnea management, if you want to do treatment tongue position, will you just decide the treatment plan based on treatment staging? No, you won't. But for you to have some kind of an idea whether this patient will or may have a tongue-based component to your problem, yes, there may be a high probability. That's all Friedman staging is about. The next uh, uh, kind of classification that one needs to understand is called the palatal phenotype. This is very, very simple. It basically differentiates the soft palate into three types based on the distance between the hard palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall. If the distance between the end of the hard palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall is more, you call it an oblique palate. If the distance between the posterior pharyngeal wall and the hard palate is less, it is called a vertical palate. Now, what does that mean to the ENT surgeon? It basically means that this is a skeletal patient. This is a soft tissue patient. So, in this particular patient, if you do any kind of palatal surgery, your success rate will not be good. Why? Because the distance, the retropalatal obstruction will not be eliminated even if you remove the entire soft palate. Whereas here, if you remove the entire soft palate, uh, if you remove the entire soft palate, the distance between the hard palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall is less. So this patient becomes a skeletal patient, hence a skeletal algorithm of management. This patient is a soft tissue patient, hence a soft tissue algorithm. How would you know on your scopy? If you put the scope, your flexible scope behind at the edge of the soft palate and you look down, if your palate is, uh, if your palate is going down like a slide, then it is a oblique palate. If your, if your soft palate is falling down like a drape, then it is a vertical palate. But unfortunately, a lot of patients have intermediate palates. And hence, even though you will get some kind of an idea whether this patient is going in the direction of a skeletal or a soft tissue in your evaluation, 
you will still not be very sure based on this particular criteria to go with which algorithm to follow. The next classification that we commonly use in uh, OSA is the Moore's classification. It is by Kent Moore, who's a maxillofacial surgeon, who has come out with these basic uh, classes, that is A, B, and C. A means retroglossal, B means retroglossal, retroepiglottic, and C means retroepiglottic. So this classification is based on how the uh, hypopharynx is basically causing a particular obstruction, whether it is base tongue alone or base tongue and epiglottis or epiglottis alone. How would you understand this? Just by a simple lateral cephalometry. A simple lateral cephalometry will give a lot of information about this kind of an obstruction. You don't need any kind of a big examination because even if you put a flexible scope and look inside, right, you will not be able to understand because you're endoluminal. So you may not be able to understand very clearly whether it is a big tongue base causing the problem or it is just the upper part of the tongue base which is causing the problem because your scope is above here. So how do you know what's going on below? A simple lateral cephalometry will give you this kind of classification. The last but not the least that you need to understand is called the karmic lehan classification. Now this as an ENT surgeon who deals with sleep apnea management is very important because you have to be there at the time of intubation, at the time of extubation. Because if you are not there, the problem is the anesthetist may not, because you are the king of the upper airway. Nobody can evaluate or manage upper airway as we can, not even anesthetist. So this kind of a classification, we will know if, if the, if the moment you put the scope in the upper airway, the moment you're looking down from the posterior coana, if you are able to look back and see the entire airway beautifully, it's a grade one. If you are basically looking at the, the posterior half of the, uh, of the laryngeal inlet, two, if you are only seeing the arytenoids, it's three, four, that means this is going to be impossible to intubate. So these patients, you have to be very, very careful. And this not only tells you uh, difficulty in terms of your procedure, but it also tells you difficulty in terms of intubation and extubation. These are patients that are going to cause you problems. So these are all the classifications that we normally use during as, an, as, a, uh, as somebody who is dealing with uh, uh, in OSA. Is it clear? Very, very clear, sir. Very clear. Down. Carry on. Then it is very, very important that a dynamic assessment of the upper airway is necessary because our upper airway is not static. It is dynamic. It is whatever evaluation you have done in terms of classifications, or uh, screening tools, all of them will not give you an understanding of the dynamic airway. It, 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 it is only giving you a, a snapshot. But we all know that the airway is dynamic and it has to be evaluated not only in, 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 in a dynamic way, but it also has to be evaluated in sleep. So when you want to assess the dynamic uh, airway, you can. There are methods that to evaluate it when you are awake, and there are methods that you can do when you are asleep. This is the if those of you who have done uh, their post graduations in the early two thousands and in 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 nineties would very beautifully know the maneuver called Muller's maneuver, wherein the scope goes in 
and you pinch the nose and you do a valsalva, a reverse valsalva. But this is called a, a, a Muller's maneuver. None of us uses that anymore, even though a Muller's maneuver or uh, evaluation of the upper airway can give you a decent understanding of the evaluation at the level of the palate. But what it doesn't give you is the contribution that the base tongue and the epiglottis can give in order to uh, uh, prognosticate your surgical intervention or choose the right kind of tool. With that in mind, how do you assess the severity of the disease? And this we have a totally different talk altogether. Boss, how are we doing with time? Are we all right? Perfect, perfect, sir, perfect. We so, can carry on. Yeah, so now, till now, what we have done, we have taken history, we have done questionnaires, we have assessed the patient's phenotype physically, but what do we know in terms of the pathophysiology? How do you know what is going on in terms of the disease burden? This is called polysomnography, wherein we understand the severity or the disease burden of what this disease is doing to this particular individual. Now, there are four levels that we will discuss in the subsequent talk. I just brought this slide so that in evaluation, the sleep study has to be done at this juncture. After a thorough evaluation of the upper airway, after the flexible evaluation of the upper airway, the next step you need to do is this sleep study. So in the sleep study, there are lots of things that we will discuss, which I will talk in the subsequent talk. What is the sleep study telling you? The sleep study is telling you the need for treatment and the urgency for treatment. It does not tell you as a surgeon or a physician, what is the right modality of treatment for you? It just tells you, does this patient need treatment? What is the severity of the problem? How urgently does he need the treatment? And this is at this juncture would like in the future, probably in the next few years, we'll have just a 3D face photography, which will predict uh, once you, the, the, the scan will just do this 3D evaluation of the upper airway. And this is uh, lots of studies are going on. You don't even have to go through all these evaluations, just 3D, the, the, the computer will read and then probably it'll give you your severity of the problem and the chance with which the, the person may have, uh, you know, obstructive sleep apnea. With all that, you as a surgeon is very, uh, it's important that you come to the surgical planning. What is the correct procedure to be performed on the correct patient? So once you've identified the sleep study, only you should come to this stage. Before that, it is imperative that you offer the gold standard therapy, which is the sleep, which is CPAP to the patient. You can only offer it if you can know that the patient can succeed with the gold standard therapy. And the success rate of gold standard therapy will only be good if the, their, the preferential port of entry, which is the nose. If the nose is good, the CPAP will be clear. So before you come to surgical planning, before you come to giving a CPAP also, once you do the sleep study, it is important that you discuss the nose with the patient to tell him whether how he will succeed. Now, there is a very clear-cut three-pronged philosophy in surgical management. The first one is, is your patient a global patient or a local patient? Now, this is the tongue and these are the tonsils. Do you think this particular patient will succeed with the CPAP? No, he won't. So if you have a patient like this, there is a very, very high chance that this particular patient may not succeed with the gold standard therapy. If there is this particular patient, and if you think that this patient has a condition like 
uh, obesity hyperventilation syndrome, then it is important that you stabilize this patient. How do you differentiate between obesity hyperventilation syndrome and obstructive sleep apnea? Through a simple ABG. An ABG will tell you whether the patient is retaining CO2 during the day or no. So if you see an obese patient, if you see that the patient is panting when he comes to sit in front of you, if you are suspecting obesity hyperventilation syndrome, just get an ABG. Once you get an ABG, you will know how much PCO2 is there. And if you think that the PCO2 is high, then you are going, you have an obesity hyperventilation syndrome in head and you have no business to touch this patient. The second concept that you need to understand is the concept of soft tissue and bony. If you have to understand this particular slide, in a patient with obesity, which is marked by this mesh, if you put this mesh in this bony enclosure, the airway is very narrow. As opposed to, in this patient, the bony enclosure is narrow, the soft tissue is normal. Even in these patients, if you put this, the airway is becoming narrow. So you need to understand whether your patient is a skeletal patient or a soft tissue patient. Because if you have a skeletal patient and you do a soft tissue procedure for your patient, you are not going to succeed. The third important concept is the concept of dynamic and static obstructions. All static obstructions have to be removed as ENT surgeon before you address the dynamic component. Because static obstructions will cause problems in terms of even CPAP use. So static obstructions from dynamic obstructions have to be evaluated and cleared off. So the three-pronged philosophy is global versus local, soft tissue versus skeletal, static versus dynamic. These are fundamentals of managing or putting your thought processes as to how we are going to manage your particular patient. So these are examples of static obstructions. This is an adult adenoid. If you give a CPAP to this patient, obviously he's not going to succeed. This is a patient who has been given, a, an 18 year patient who has been given a, bi, a BiPAP because the CPAP pressures were very high. This is a static obstruction. This obstruction has to be cleared before you do any kind of a procedure. Whereas a dynamic obstruction like this is something that happens only during sleep. And this particular patient with this kind of an epiglottic collapse, if you give a CPAP, they will not succeed. So we need to understand the static and the dynamic obstruction funda. So there are different modalities, as I said, and we know that evaluation in sleep changes our sleep and choices from 40% to 75%. And you need to choose the right, if those of you in my generation will, under, will, will know this particular photograph, this is Indiana Jones, where you have to choose the right one. What is the right way of, of, of evaluation? which is backed by adequate evidence, where just because you feel that this is the single modality to manage, you should not. You should choose the right modality, which is backed by a lot of evidence. And drug-induced sleep endoscopy is the way forward because this is the gold standard with which you will be using various pharmacological agents to understand the behavior of the upper airway. And we as ENT surgeons who deal with this particular problem day in and day out are very, very well poised to understand this behavior. So this I'm going to talk in, the, in, a, in a completely different topic. And this is how it's done. I, uh, I will, because we have a full talk there, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, talk about that in detail. 
At this point, I thought we can bring in a couple of case scenarios to take this further. Boss, I need your help at this point. Should I talk about polysomnography now or shall I discuss some case scenarios and then go to polysomnography? I think we can discuss case scenarios and then uh, maybe, uh, are you going to do a PSG uh, today or? Uh, no, PSG is today, but uh, shall I discuss PSG in detail and then do polysomnography and then do case scenarios? Yeah, that would be better. That will be better, right? Okay. Yeah. I think we will just uh, do the case scenarios. Uh, let me just... Uh, am I going... Uh, uh, are things okay? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Absolutely incredible. This is the best ever lecture, boss, I have listened to in oh, sleep apnea. I'm glad. I have heard several lectures, but uh, nothing compared to this. Believe me. Absolutely incredible. Thank you. Screen, uh, screen sharing has stopped and the share window is closed. Okay. Now I think I have to uh, start sharing. Yes. Can you see the screen now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So again, disclaimer was lots of grass will be grass will be there. Please don't get intimidated. Um, little bit of physiology, little bit of brushing up of uh, respiratory medicine. But I think this is most important. If there is anything that you will take back home today, it will be this. So please pay attention. So when do we do sleep study? Right? So most sleep disorders can be diagnosed clinically. That means narcolepsy can be diagnosed clinically. You don't need to do a sleep study, right? The moment you see a guy and you're talking to him and he suddenly goes into sleep, he's got narcolepsy. But a polysomnography is a different ball game altogether. So polysomnography is usually done for these basic broad headings. One. It is recommended for evaluation of sleep-related breathing disorders. Polysomnography is uh, important to evaluate parasomnias. And polysomnography is very, very important in evaluating hypersomnias. Right? But we as ENT surgeons have no business to deal with the lower two. But... We have to have an understanding as to what are the cases that you are going to refer to our colleagues. So it is important that you have to learn to understand and decipher your polysomnography. Now, what all can a polysomnography tell us? Right? The polysomnography, as the word says, poly means multiple, somno means sleep. Graphy means recording. Now, in polysomnography, we are basically going to evaluate four kind of parameters. Parameters of sleep, parameters of the heart, parameters of respiration, and limb movements. Now, parameters of sleep, what, are our, what all are we evaluating? One. We need to evaluate the duration of sleep, not only duration in bed, but duration of sleep. The patterns of sleep, the quality of sleep, and the behavior during sleep. So these are the four parameters that we will get the information from a polysomnography during sleep. During what are the cardiorespiratory parameters, you will get the quality of breathing. That means, what kind of breathing is it? Is it a kind stop breathing or is it a regular breathing? Flow limitation. Is there a limitation 
to the amount of air that is growing through your nose? Is there breath stoppage? What is the quantification of flow limitation? That means, is your flow limitation 50%? Is your flow limitation 30%? Or is it 90%? What are the positional characteristics? That means, are you supine and choking? Are you lateral and choking? Number next, pulse. How is your pulse? Are you having arrhythmias? And ECG, which will tell us whether are you having bradys? Are you having uh, any kind of uh, you know, patterns of uh, ECG disorders? Are you looking at arrhythmias and things like that? And limb movements, like I said, periodic limb movements and measurement of limb movement disorder is very, very important to quantify the, se the seriousness of the arousal problem, which is directly proportionate to the excessive daytime sleepiness symptoms. And that is why this limb movement is very important. So when you do a sleep study, right, you will get a ton of data. Okay. So each of these data has to be deciphered into different kind of sections or fragments. And these sections or, or fragments are called epochs. For example, you have the first one, which is the sleep staging. Means what? Means N1, N2, N3, REM. These are your EEG data. Okay. This EEG data has to be evaluated in 30 second epochs. All right. So the computer will be read, will be, uh, 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 data will be just going through. I'll show you, I have screenshots of each one of them. So I will tell you how each one of these epochs will look. Then you have the EEG arousals. That means your sleep stage is going on and then you have an arousal. Uh, an arousal. That means every three to 15 seconds, you have to look for an arousal. Then you have the respiratory events. That means Respiratory event epoch is a two to five minute epoch. This is again that. So if you look at each one of these, sleep stage is the data that you are getting from your EEG leads. Respiratory data is coming from your thoracoabdominal leads and your nasal uh, cannulae. And link movement leads are coming from your EMG. All right. And each one of them have different kind of, uh, 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 so once you look at that particular uh, screenshot, you will understand. So all of them are not read in the same way. So sleep stages have to be read in 30 second epochs. Arousals have to be looked at in every 15 seconds. Respiratory events should be looked at between two to five minutes. Kind Stokes breathing has to be looked in 10 minute epochs and periodic lamb movement has to be evaluated in five minute epochs. Please remember this. Now, the sleep studies can be basically divided into two kinds. The lab-based studies and the HST called the home sleep studies. Now, each of these levels, based on where you do it and the amount of data you are getting depends on, the level depends on each of the data. So, for example, level one, which is the gold standard test. This is a lab-based test. You have a beautiful sleep lab. You are going to sleep, sleep there. You have the nice sheets. You have nice air conditioning. But there will be a camera that is actually recording your every breath, your every move. And it is the, uh, you are recording EEGs, EOGs, EMGs, EEGs, the works. You are recording everything. Now, what is the difference between level one and level two? Level two is everything that level one does, except that it is not supervised. So a level one study done at home or in your hospital room 
becomes a level two study. Now, what is the biggest problem with this level two study? One, the, the, the problem is if the lead comes off, see, most of our leads are stuck on the brain, right? The EEG leads, they tend to come off. So what happens is one, if these leads come off, one, that particular data is not being recorded. And then the person who's getting the study done also doesn't realize that the, the lead has come off. So the whole particular exercise goes to waste. The second most important uh, uh, thing with this is if a patient has neuropsychological problems, like for example, a patient has depression and is taking medicine for depression, you should not be doing this particular study. The third level is basically a cardiorespiratory kind of a study. Basically, if you have a patient who is scoring very high on your stop bank questionnaire, who's scoring clinically, you have he has huge tonsils, thick ulna, gross septal deviation, great four lingual tonsils, scoring very high on the uh, on on your suspicion level for obstructive sleep apnea, not having any comorbidities, get a level two, level three study. So, as ENTs, if you think your patient has no comorbidities, no drugs, like not, not on any kind of CNS medication, get a level three study done at home. No problem. But if you have a patient with comorbid conditions, like insomnia, like depression, like uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, or heart failure, always, always get a level one study. So the take home message for us ENTs is, if a patient has comorbidities, do a level one study. If a patient has no comorbidities, no drugs, scoring high on your suspicion level, get a level three study. What is level four? Level four is basically a very simple uh, sort of a measurement of um, uh, cardiorespiratory. And this is basically done just for screening. So supposing you want to do a, a, a study of, again, all the uh, uh, sort of doctors in your hospital doing a sleep study, then, I mean, uh, you want to find out who of them may have obstructive sleep apnea, then you do a level four study. So for all practical purposes, don't do a level four study. It is only a screening tool. So you can do any one of these three studies. Now, earlier, we used to use the different, and this is physiology, and all of us remember that, AASM is the umbrella organization which all of us follow. This is the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. All the definitions, all the criteria, all the success rate, failure rates are defined by AASM guidelines. This is the gospel. Now, AASM guidelines we follow are WAC, N1, N2, N3, and REM. Earlier, people used to use stages three and four. Now, three and four stages have been amalgamated into N3. So, you have wake, you have N1, N2, N3, REM. So these three are non-REM and this is REM. So now let us go into each stage and identify what are the pathognomonic waves. And I will show you what each one of those waves looks like on, um, on uh, EEG. Now, when the eyes are open, you have very high amplitude waves like this. This is waves, okay? This is wake. And this is EEG data coming from frontal. This is from the central. And this is your EEG data. Uh, this is uh, EOG data. This is all very high activity data. Also, you will get high EMG tone because the muscle is active. 
Now, as the person goes into slowly the eyes close. Now, just because the eyes close does not mean the patient goes off into sleep. So the waves are slightly lower in amplitude. And hence, this is called the eye closed phase of wake. Okay. So these are all the wake phase. All right. These are all wake phase high activity. And as you guys take go through the next step and you'll be able to see, see, look, this is packed with activity. The brain is active with activity and the whole screen is glowing up with packed activity. Now, stage one of non-REM. Now, slowly the activity is going down on EEG. So this is called theta waves. The wave amplitude is going down. This wave is four to seven hertz. And you can, in EOG, the rolling up of ice will be seen. Look how calm this is. Slowly, this is stage one. If you compare it with this, look at this screen and look at this screen. This is calm. But you look how these waves are. These are, these are like waves in a, in a calm ocean. Okay? These are up, down, up, down. These are smooth. And you can see the uh, activity which is throughout all the, these are calm and the patient in its stage one sleep. Next comes stage two. Stage two is characterized by two kinds of waves. They are called sleep spindles and K complexes. Okay. Now, sleep spindles are fast. They are this kind of activity. See, sudden bursts of activity. These are called sleep spindles. Now, these are very different from the theta waves that I showed you. So, this is a not a very calm ocean wave. These are waves with sudden bursts of activity, right? Now, these are called sleep spindles. Now, another pathognomonic, which is classic of N2 sleep, are called K complexes. Now, how do you differentiate a, uh, a spindle wave from K complex? is that in spindle, there is no negative down. In this screen, I have not captured that, but this is a spindle wave. If the same thing would have gone down like this, that becomes a K complex. The moment you see this with a K complex, that means it is N2. So sleep spindles and K complexes are pathognomonic of N2 sleep, and N2 is where most adult human beings sleep. Majority of the sleep happens in N2 sleep. Not N1, but N2 sleep. Then comes slow wave sleep. This is called delta waves, okay? Look at this, huge waves, huge waves, but they, you should not confuse this with wake, okay? This is smooth waves going in up and down, up and down. So this kind of architecture of waves is called N3 sleep, okay? Very, very different from this. This is big waves. This is called slow wave sleep. So the moment you look at this big, big waves, this is called slow wave sleep. Okay, now once you look at slow wave sleep like this, then you know that the patient has achieved that stage of sleep. Now this particular individual, obviously, or most adults spend very less time in this sleep. This is the deep sleep that your watches talk to you about. This is very restorative sleep. And as the age progresses, or as the age uh, of the individual progresses, the, end, the stage of the sleep keeps going down. 
So if you see an older individual with maximum N1, N2 sleep, that is very physiological for them. If you don't see N3 sleep in a 75-year-old, doesn't mean anything. Now, this is stage R, R called REM sleep. REM sleep, look at how the eyes are. Eyes are rapidly moving, like as if the person is awake. And the activity is again bustling with activity. The difference is that the moment you see big activity with eye movement, unlike this, see, eye movement is not there. Eye movement is there. With big amplitude waves, that means the patient is in REM. Now, REM sleep is very important to identify because the, the person will have maximum apneic spells during REM. Why? The muscle is in atonia. So the brain is active. The EMG is zero, no activity. It's a fantastic thing to happen because imagine your brain is dreaming. Your dreams come in REM. And if you are getting a dream of some, your, somebody is charging you or somebody is about to kill you, and your hands and legs are active, imagine, what would you do? You would hurt yourself or you would hurt the sleeping partner. But nature has done such a beautiful thing that it has paralyzed the muscle and your brain is active. You can dream what you want, but your muscle will be paralyzed so that you don't harm yourself or your partner during your dreams. So these are very important in terms of CNS markers or these are the EEG data that would come out. Now, the next most important thing are the respiratory data, which are apnea, hypopnea, RERA. Now, these three things are very, very important and each of them can be either central, obstructive or mixed. Central means there the brain is telling you not to breathe. Obstructive means the brain is telling you to breathe, but you are not able to breathe because of the obstruction in the upper airway. And mixed means, please remember, this is very, very important, dear colleagues. Mixed means central followed by obstructive. Okay, the first it starts with a central apnea. And then it turns into an obstructive apnea. The duration is very important. Hypopnea can be central or obstructive. RERA means respiration effort related arousals. Now, what is respiratory effort related arousals? In respiratory effort related arousals, there is no desaturation. The person keep, gets up multiple times just by the sheer effort that the patient is putting in to get air into his body. When is or where is RERA important? To qual quantify a patient or qualify a patient for the condition called upper airway resistance syndrome. Remember, we spoke about UARS. In UARS, there is no desaturation. There is no flow limitation. There is only arousal because of increased work of breathing. And this is called as RERA. So in respiratory parameters, you have to look at apnea, hypopnea, and RERA. So what does apnea mean? So there is a drop in the signal by more than 90%. Or in simple terms, an absolute cessation of airflow at the nose and mouth for about 10 seconds qualifies as apnea. What is very interesting is you need not have an associated oxygen desaturation to qualify as apnea. So in your, in your uh, sleep study, in your PSG, if there is an absolute drop in airflow at the nose and mouth for 10 seconds, that qualifies as apnea. This is called apnea. Please pay attention to the flow. This is a polysomnography, dear colleagues. This is how, uh, this is a snapshot. This is one epoch. 
Okay, each one of this is one epoch. See, obstructive apnea, there is complete flow. P flow means there is no flow. This is EMG. This is thoracic. This is abdominal activity. See how much the abdominal activity and thoracic activity is not there. Ab abdominal activity is there. Thoracic activity is not there. That means you're trying, you're, you're, uh, your breathing has become an abdominal thoracic kind of breathing. And there is absolutely no airflow. This is an obstructive apnea. And you can see how the airway is going and there is absolutely no snore. Suddenly, there is airflow because of increased respiratory effort and then there is a snore. And this is patient is supine. Right? And this is how you have to score each one of them. See the desaturations SpO2, suddenly there is a drop. So this is how you need to look at. See, each of these epochs give us this particular information. Now, hypopnea, on the other hand, is a 30% reduction in the signal. Now, associated with a more than 3% reduction in oxygen desaturation, then only you have to call it a hypopnea. And the duration of this drop has to be more than 10 seconds. See, 10 seconds is common for apnea and hypopnea. In, ap in apnea, there is absolute cessation, whereas in hypopnea, there is a 30% reduction in the, uh, in the signal at the level of the nasal prongs, all right? So that is apnea, which is the bigger boss, hypopnea, which is the smaller box boss. Here you can see that there is, this, is, this is complete flow limitation. This is central apnea. This is, again, there is increased flow. And you can see to quanti qualify as a central apnea, there is no movement anywhere. Right? There is absolutely no limitation. There is no obstruction anywhere. Third is RERA. This is slightly complex, but this is how it shows that there is flow. There is increased, uh, uh, there is reduction in slight flow, and then there is an arousal. Flow limitation with arousal means respiration revo uh, re uh, evoked repeated arousal, and this qualifies as RERA. But is there oxygen desaturation here? Not really. Right? So this is RERA. Now, Chine Stokes breathing is something that we need to know. This is classical of uh, um, central sleep apnea, and this is very classical in respiratory failure and in heart, in, um, in, uh, heart failure. Now, what is respiratory polygraphy? There is a difference between polygraphy and polysomnography. Okay. Now, in polygraphy, there is no EEG. So if you have a respiratory cardio or a cardiorespiratory issue, then it becomes the uh, cardiorespiratory parameters measurement, then it becomes a polygraphy. A polysomnography or a PSG means you have to have EEG. Right? This is very, very important. So level three, level four are polygraphies, whereas level one and level two are polysomnographies. So this is the differentiation between the both. So once you have all this data, you come to a conclusion to grade the severity. Normal means less than five. Mild means five to 15. Apnea, hypopnea index indices. Moderate means 5 to 15, and severe means more than 30. All of them together becomes, and uh, that is how you score the severity of the sleep apnea. Here are some examples. Let us just quickly go through them. AHI is 58, means apnea hypopnea index is 58. That means per hour of sleep, he's choking about 58 times. 
that comes to almost once every minute. The other thing that you need to understand is the, is the metric of measure called sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency means the report has, the person has slept more than 85%. If a sleep efficiency is less than 85%, that means the person has not slept well and the value of this report is not very good. Now, once you look at AHI, you should look at oxygen parameters. Very readily, you can see that the patient's average is 98, but the minimum saturation is 66. That means the patient is having significant desaturations. The next metric of measure that you need to look at or parameter is this called polygraphy, wherein you get sleep stages, you get the oximetry, you get the pulse, you get the airflow, you get the snoring, and you get the positioning. Next, you need to look at, in the AHI, how much of them are apneas, how much of them are hypopneas? Because the end result of the value that you're getting is apnea hypopnea index. It is a, it's a sum total of apneas and hypopneas. Supposing you do a good surgical intervention, this AHI before surgery is 58, and after surgery also is 58, but if the AHI after surgery is only predominant by hypopneas and not by, apo and not by apneas, what does that tell you? It tells you that you have done a good surgery and reduce the disease burden. And that is the reason why AHI is not a very good parameter. And now lots of things are now coming in to replace AHI as the final metric of measure to tell us whether uh, your treatment is successful or failure. The next thing you need to understand is the distribution across measurement time whether in the first hour of sleep, second hour of sleep, third hour of sleep, this is, it tells you across measurement time, what are all the events that happened. And lowest desaturations or highest desaturation, this is again very, very important. The amount of desaturation per hour, 80 per hour is very important in the sleep study. This tells you the position, the right, whether the patient is supine or non-supine. That also gives you an understanding of whether the patient is a positional sleep apneic or a non-positional sleep apneic. If the patient's apnea hypopnea index is, let us say, 50 in supine and 25 in non-supine, this patient qualifies to be called a positional sleep apneic. And that is why this parameter is very important. And these are sleep stages like we discussed, and this is a proper level two study. And these are all the metrics of measure that you need to understand. This is a, uh, another a kind of sleep study called watch pad study. Some of you must have come across this. This is somewhere between level two and level three, wherein you get all the parameters in uh, like AHI, RDI, sleep positioning, snoring, everything. This is also a very good uh, sort of a sleep study uh, you can do. Also, it can be done in the pediatric age group. From eight years onwards, it is approved. And this is a very good tool, not very cumbersome. It has just got a watch and a simple probe to the finger. And you can get all this particular data. And this is a level three data called polygraphy, wherein you don't get EEG in this. This is the commonest sleep uh, study that we as ENTs do, but it is very important to look at flow limitations, the amount of oxygen desaturation that is happening. And this is, this is something that will give you cardiorespiratory, but it does not give you stage of sleep. Like for example, it tells you that so many apnea, hypopnea indices have happened, but does it tell you that all of these are majority of things of these are happening during REM or non-REM sleep? We don't know. 
So we need to be very careful while interpreting a level three study. So this is how a level three study is. Again, giving you well uh, in supine, non-supine. The reason why I bought this report is see, this is a classical uh, positional sleep apnea. In supine, his apnea hypopnea index is 17, and non-supine, it is 4.2. All you have to do is ask the patient to sleep to one side, and he becomes a non-OSA patient. So this is how it is. So Boss, are you all awake? Of course, of course. I'm sorry, I took a lot of time. I think uh, uh, I've stuck to time, but I think uh, it has gone too overboard. I don't know. No, 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 it's not gone overboard. This is the best, I told you, the best lecture which we have ever come across in sleep apnea. A big, 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 big congratulations to you. The kind of command you have on the subject is unbelievable and that too the reading of the uh, the eeg stuff is incredible uh, can we go for the sleep uh, the, the scenarios or uh, questions we, or we can go for questions or we can go for uh, or we can do the uh, i actually there is sleep endoscopy but i think that will become too much now we can do it tomorrow no, no, we'll do it tomorrow Yes. Sleep endoscopy will do it tomorrow. See, yes. I have a few questions. Number Shoot, one. Boss. Yeah. Uh, case scenarios uh, we'll do tomorrow. Yes. Done. Done. Because I'm also going to travel tomorrow early morning to Hyderabad. So okay. <laughs> sure. I might have to sleep now. I would uh, put questions open now. Number one yeah. is um, the basic question of... Uh, is there a concept called adenoid facies or not? Because yes. I have read several articles where there is no such uh, data pointing out to the adenoid causing the facies. Yeah. Uh, so what is your... Uh, so adenoid facies is just a term, right? It's just a term to actually... Uh, it's, a, it's a broad, like how we call as... Uh, sleep-related breathing disorder. This is a broad term to quantify a particular look of a patient. So what does it, what does it uh, basically, uh, uh, it's a conglomeration of a high-arched palate, of sunken eyes, of a, a retrognathia. All of these are consequences of chronic mouth breathing that results in this typical craniofacial look that we, that in common terms is called adenoid facies. There is no medical term called as adenoid facies. No, no. The question is whether the adenoid is causing these uh, this facies. This is the question. So uh, there is evidence in literature yeah. now uh, saying that the adenoid is not causing this facies because I have read three or four papers on that. What is your take on that? I have seen a lot of these patients was in the pediatric age group. Okay, um, fine. Uh, so you feel that, yes, it, it is, is there? Yes. Yeah, I agree. Okay, fine. Now, um, the next question I wanted to ask you is that uh, we do a sleep study. Yeah. Uh, um, what to say, level three study. Huh. And that is a general thing which we do. Mm. And um, uh, uh, yeah, if it is going to be uh, apnea, hypopnea index, and the hypopnea, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the hypopnea is high and the apnea yeah. is uh, sort of, you know, uh, low. less uh, yeah. low. And then uh, would you still consider uh, uh, surgery on this patient? So what is your uh, this one take so, on that? So basically, see, that is where the whole funda of AHI is flawed because... An AHI of 50, which is being driven by apnea, which is a bigger goon, compared to uh, a AHI of 50, which is predominant by hypopnea, are treated as the same level. That is a exactly. fundamental exactly. mistake. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you have done a, a treatment for a patient, 
and mm. his ahi remains about see there is what is called a shares criteria okay mm. wherein if to call a treatment successful you have to bring down the ahi of by 50% and below 20 so not only you have to reduce the ahi below 20 you have to reduce the ahi by 50% so if by that kind of a metric all kinds of treatments which are uh, surgically oriented will fail the that is a very big debate now the problem here is if you have a ahi which is predominantly driven by hypopneas you have a patient who has a better or should i say lesser disease burden than somebody who has high ahi high driven by apnea a apnea is the bigger don hypopnea is a smaller don the the disease severity and disease burden in terms of oxidative stress is worse for apnea compared to hypopnea yeah very nice now let me take the questions of the audience there are so many uh, who have asked questions can i with your permission take the questions sure, please please okay dhiren kumar says an excellent lecture of course i agree and uh, this is one of the best lectures i have heard on sleep apnea because of the don who is actually talking the well understood uh, teacher always con- conveys the best now uh, do you mean that ahi zero is fully awake siddharth wanka wants to know so ahi zero means there are no apneas or hypopneas now in this particular individual there may be flow limitations number 1 we need to also look at the uh, uh, the symptomatology and in a sleep study if there are no apneas and hypopneas in a, a driven sleep study and you have done a sleep study for that particular individual then either something is wrong with that test or the interpretation is wrong it is unlikely yeah. yeah so uh, prahlad i'll take that question uh, tomorrow because this has not come under the purview of this lecture uh, about the weight reduction program and that he will yeah, be yeah. talking we are talking yeah. later yeah um so another question by mitesh sharma sir in pediatric sleep apnea the severity is not proportional to tonsillar hypertrophy grade why now what we need to understand in pediatric sleep apnea the metric of measure is very different okay even one in terms of ahi is considered to be significant number one number two the higher it, if you have a patient with tonsils which are not grade say grade one or grade two and if you think history wise there is a uh, severe sleep apnea that means there may be a problem with the larynx because larynx also contributes to pediatric sleep apnea so that's something that we will talk about later yeah you will go you going to talk on the third day yeah. i have another question uh, personally i have some experience in this uh, patient uh, uh, presents to us and uh, his oxygen saturation is around 80 85 mm. right and um, he say he is a copd patient right. and also having snoring and uh, people talk about happy hypoxia the yes. patient is used to it yes now uh, if he has got snoring would you operate and would you treat this patient no so if the patient has hyper happy hypoxia that means this particular patient so he's got 80% when he is awake correct if i am understood yeah yes. this patient is in respiratory failure so we should not touch this patient so pap will be the uh, treatment of choice not only pap it has to be bipap yeah bipap perfect has to be bipap yeah perfect uh, so that's what i have been uh, giving in in fact the patient is my mother that's why oh, i said <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay so uh, i will throw the, uh, the this one open uh, to the audience is a very very interesting lecture boss i am telling you very very uh, nice i am really impressed by your knowledge uh, can i have dr shilpi on the line because uh, she was very particular that uh, is she there or not dr shilpi 
Yes, sir. I am listening, yeah. sir. So you can comment on this lecture and uh, also ask questions if you have. It was uh, very informative. It's like eye opener to uh, OSA, and I've learned that we have much much more to do, and much much more to learn in this field. And it's an ocean itself, it seems. So yes, I really sure. thanks uh, for such. You have any questions? Ah, uh, for now I don't have a question, but maybe mm -hmm. as it uh, proceeds further, I'll have a lot. As we go to the second and third lecture, we'll have okay, right. Uh, anybody else, Dr. Satya? Hello. Yeah, Satya. Sir, uh, the lecture was too good, sir. We are now now only coming to learn what all what all is happening outside with OSA and you know how much advancements that we have to go through. Hoping to work together, Satya. We should yes. work together and bring up that particular. subject also yes sir definitely it's, sir. it's an ocean and ent has to be the front runner i think in the next few years the implant is also going to come it's yes. going to be a game changer for everything there are lots yes. of implants that are coming up so huge huge uh, things that are going to and your team should be at the front runner as uh, you know as uh, the whole country how you are taking up the other fields as well yes, i would yes. be very happy to work hand in glove with sir, you sir i think that is the future sir everybody working together is the future in uh, in uh, in this sir do you yes. believe in that people person working alone anymore it's all yes. it's yeah. all the people working, working together that is the exactly. future sir. and i just want to tell something be, i, I went recently question. to a country where they said Do you know that the eye implants have started, like cochlear implants? They have started eye implants. Yeah, I That's think you would know about it. No, it's phenomenal, boss. I mean, the kind of implants that are they are putting phrenic nerve implants for central sleep apnea now. Yeah, there are Absolutely phrenic implants. There are there are everything. I mean, it's going to be next few years are going to be very exciting. Yeah, perfect. So I think I we'll have, meet. I have uh, one point, sir. I just I, I wanted to ask one thing. Uh, what uh, books do you recommend for the beginner, sir, to uh, understand OSA? Sure. And uh, what are the landmark papers, or who is the person that we should follow when it comes to surgery or results or future of OSA? As Doctor Senior Kishore, why are you asking him? No, 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 Let Chippy, me. I will give you all that. You are asking that... the legend in sleep apnea whom whom to follow, ah? Huh? No, no, no. Yeah, it's a stupid no, question. I will. Boss. No, 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 sir. No. Actually, here in certain meetings, they were they huh? were American doctors, and I was interacting with them, and they suggested they were telling me that hypoglossal implants are doing very very well in uh, yes America. So I had no clue about it. So I just Chippy, wanted to. That's what no, I'm that saying. That will come. That will all come in the third lecture by boss. All that is coming. All that is coming. This is going to be a complete uh, game. Yeah. There is hypoglossal. There is an ansa, a pacing. There is. There are lots of things that are happening. But uh, you're very right. We need to start off from basic. What I will try to do. is i will try to get pdfs of uh, all the basic books and i will try to uh, put it in this group was excellent thank so excellent much, thank you so much thank you so much sir excellent yeah. excellent dr srinivas really god bless you and uh, you know you're doing a great service and this always will be available on uh, our channel yeah for all of them to uh, have sort of a this will be the ultimate reference in sleep apnea yeah and uh, i'm sure that you'll be including surgery surgical videos also yes yes and yes second day or third day uh, tomorrow second day actually yeah tomorrow. because i think tomorrow it will be a good thing begin drug induced sleep endoscopy and surgery together because a lot yeah. of surgery will depend on and i would like it tomorrow that i'm going to post some uh, sleep endoscopy videos and mm -hmm. i would like our delegates to score it that would be fantastic <laughs> fantastic fantastic actually so let us score the sleep video yeah, you know what i am going to do i am planning for something different boss huh. i am going to i am coming to hyderabad no i'll come to your clinic straight away <laughs> are boss <laughs> we'll i am planning to 
we'll do yeah. the sleep in this company like an Maybe interview i'm going to do an interview live interview with you yeah sure i'll come to you either ways maybe tomorrow no, we can no, connect no, i'm just joking but tomorrow since i'm in hyderabad anyway yeah, we I'll can connect it. tomorrow i'll yeah, come I'll over be. and then we can sit and great. have the fantastic uh, dr sinivas i'm sorry too much of time also but really oh, you no, that's have fine. your your uh, your phenomenal believe me and uh, thank, thank you. you so much we'll meet uh, this will be three sessions yes. three sessions enough for you huh? or you not really more? not really but That's, we'll try we'll to extend it to four no we'll extend it to four i'll be happy yeah yeah we'll, we'll see boss do whatever best this i'm telling you again should be the ultimate reference then i will uh, and please. anybody who wants learn sleep uh, they don't have to you know srinivas kishore should have given everything possible i will do that <laughs> i will do that this is what is that. my intention as shilpi Thanks. said sleep uh, uh, in the us a lot of things have now shifted to hypoglossal nerve implant we tried to get it to the country but they think that our market uh, the closest you can get a hypoglossal nerve implant is singapore that too it came this year in germany they are giving it free of cost free. boss yes i know i know yeah i know one patient who underwent a hypoglossal implant free of cost and he yeah. said it's covered by insurance yes i was like surprised <laughs> and do you know cpap is not covered by insurance in germany yeah, <laughs> yeah cpap so, not covered hypoglossal implant hypoglossal is covered <laughs> this is ultimate <laughs> anyway that is developed country anyway yeah. fine uh, so thank you i'm sorry so we, i don't want to pull you long so we will catch have, up maybe maybe satya you have to coordinate for the fourth uh, session also we would like to have an exhaustive session but every day yeah, two yeah, hours yeah. will be better uh, don't take it to uh, too much because uh, the audience also will be uh, we'll you be, know receptive yeah, fully receptive no not tired they are ready they will be receptive and uh, each will be like segments these are all very nicely planned segments then perfect then tomorrow get ready for uh, sleep endoscopy scoring so yeah. let's do this thank you dr sinivas kishore welcome thank you thank you a lot sir thank you a lot thank you man thank you thank you god bless